Hi, everybody. I'm assuming I'm on. Um, usually it counts down, but hey, I'm okay. Uh, I just hope everybody out there in the sound of my voice uh, with the live streaming, I hope everybody's well. I hope your families are well. Let's see. Let's get in here. Okay, I guess I'm using the camera. All right. Well, anyway, this is our Jewish current events class brought to you under the auspices of Temple Shalom of Pompano. I have Pompano Beach. I have had the pleasure of being their rabbi for many years now. Let's see, duh, 12 years, I think. Okay, very good. Uh, and what I'm going to be doing is presenting a mix of Jewish and secular news. And I hope that if you have uh, any comments, anything, you'll put it in the conversation bar. Now, for some reason, I am not able to see the conversation bar, but these things have a way of popping up when you stop worrying about them. I know it looks like I'm turning sideways. So I'm going to look bang at the camera. Okay. Well, I know the reason you're watching me from your home and the reason we've all been cooped up for, uh, in some cases, five weeks now, I think it is, I think for everybody, uh, is because obviously of the coronavirus. And we do certainly pray that the scientists and the folks who can study scientific evidence and make experiments and develop wonder drugs that will get us out of this mess will be uh, very effective and that they'll do their work very speedily. Uh, in the meantime, what I have here is a report from The Guardian. Now, obviously, I'm not here to shill for any particular news source, but there are some which I like better than others. And, uh, you know, just doing this and not being paid by anybody except the temple, thank God. Um, I wanted to share with you this is a story from The Guardian. Okay, now The Guardian originally is a British newspaper, but they have a global reach. How did coronavirus start? Where did it come from? Was it really Wuhan's animal market? I'm sure everybody who lives on this earth and has access to media is aware of the Wuhan animal market, or as they call it, the wet market. Now, I have to preface my remarks by saying I am not prejudiced against anybody. God forbid I am not a racist. I'm simply trying to read the story as it appeared in a very objective news source. Because what people have been doing is saying that the virus began in Wuhan's animal market. And I'm going to give you the short answer. According to this article where they interviewed many, many scientists, the answer is a definite maybe, leaning towards no. But the thing about the Wuhan market, in case you don't know, is that uh, apparently our, our Chinese friends, our brothers and sisters from China, have a great yen. They have a great desire to eat exotic meat. And among these meats, we're talking about bats and something called the pangolin, P-A-N-G-O-L-I-N. If you have access uh, to Wikipedia or some other information source, by all means, look up the pangolin. It is the most trafficked animal in the entire world. It is a small uh, mammal. It lives in the forest and it has armor but uh, frankly i wouldn't give you two cents for this armor because the armor is made up of the same material that goes into our fingernails imagine it looks like a small anteater it has a long nose it has claws and it is covered from head to toe with armor made of fingernails well not fingernails but the same material uh it is totally harmless it is a, it does not have a good time Good time. It doesn't have an easy time defending itself. And when it is attacked by a larger animal, which I'm sure is frequent, it rolls up in a ball and says, oh, please, God of the pangolins, um, protect me and hopefully it can't break my armor. But they are caught very frequently. So the whole question was, was the beastie the carrier of the virus? Well, they said they examined it. I even have a lovely photograph, albeit a small one here of the pangolin, there you are, Mr. Pangolin, okay, looking very sad and very harmless indeed, and they say the genetic makeup, the genome for this particular virus, which the pangolin was carrying, is not the same as the virus which is inf infesting human beings. Indeed, it is not unusual in the animal kingdom for animals to carry viruses but not suffer from them, and uh, I think the best example would be the tiger, which is in a New York zoo, and the virus has infected this tiger. Viruses apparently travel among various species, but we are the ones that the virus can physically hurt. It can end our lives. So I'm not making a joke about this, Lord knows. 
Um, rather that um, just, what can I say? The Wuhan wet market has been closed and uh, people are not buying meat there. It was very sad. I saw the pita ads and I'm not shilling for pita either, but uh, it's very sad seeing the way that they treat animals in that particular market. But now we have to deal with how the virus is affecting human beings. And for this, I am uh, took this particular one from jta.org, and I recommend that you go on at least once a week to see what's happening in the Jewish world. jta.org is the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, and uh, what they do is, of course, report news from the Jewish world. And this is an article that talks about how the Orthodox are being affected by the coronavirus and in many instances will not report it. They will not go to a doctor. They will not stop clustering around with uh, their Orthodox friends and relatives. And this is the Haredim. These are the ultra-Orthodox. Uh, for example, in the Belgian city of Antwerp, which I, I think is the capital, uh, there is a large Orthodox population. At least five have died and another 10 hospitalized. People call it the disease, or they say they've fallen ill, but there's a taboo, a stigma on saying to people that you have coronavirus. And where are they getting their information? Well, they quote a rabbi of the third century, okay, uh, Rabbi Nehorai, who says that when you have a disease, you should not talk about it in public. Here we go. It wasn't Nehorai. Third century, uh, Rabbi Yochanan bar Natcha, and uh, he ruled against mentioning diseases publicly. Now, look, I have the greatest regard for the rabbis of the past, for Rabbi Akiva, for Moshe Rabbeinu, for people like this who are either documented or not. But if you're getting your medical advice from a rabbi who lived in the third century, even a child can tell you you shouldn't be spending your time with this sort of thing. Well, anyway, uh, they talk about this and, and they tried interviewing a number of Orthodox rabbis in England and France, and only a couple would speak to them. One of them who got sick, this was in England, said that uh, he had a slight case and he went back to work the next week. And when the uh, newspaper or the online and media service contacted him, he said, please, I'm trying not to go public about these things. I only hope that God should send help because apparently nobody else will. Now, let's look at the bright side. It's very hard to make lemonade out of these lemons, but this is a story from Earlham, Iowa, of all places. Happens not to involve Jews, but it does involve human beings. An anonymous donor has given each household in the small Midwestern town of Earlham, Iowa, gift cards worth $150 each to ease the burden of social distancing. The total amounts to more than $82,000 in donations. The town's mayor was contacted by the mysterious donor and uh, said that I would like to financially support the town. Earlham has a population of 1,450 people. You know, for 22 years, we lived in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which was lovely and gorgeous. If anyone's watching, hey, Portsmouth, how you doing? Hope you're getting through this. But uh, there were 28,000 people there. So that seemed like a small town. But hey, this one has like 1450. So everybody started getting $50 gift cards to a local restaurant, grocery store, and coffee shop. This must have been early in the siege. And uh, they're not alone because last week, the actor-director Tyler Perry footed the grocery bill of every elderly shopper during senior shopping hour at 73 supermarkets across New Orleans, Atlanta, and Georgia. Well, thank you, Mr. Perry. That was a wonderful mitzvah. Now, what's happening in, in Israel? The non-Orthodox are not doing it so well. This is a rabbi by the name of Mikey Goldstein, and he serves a conservative shul in Rehovot. Now, the thing about Israel is this, and this has not changed since the uh, founding of the state. The uh, As far as most Israelis are concerned, 
the shul they don't davenate, davenat, the shul they don't davenat had better be orthodox. So the majority of the population, at least 70%, if not more, does not go to shul at all. However, going back, I think, to the 70s, a number of reform and conservative and uh, new age synagogues have sprung up. They have rabbis. Okay, you say. Well, I understand that in Israel, the government supports rabbis. What's the situation for the reform and the conservative? And the answer is they don't get a penny, which is tragic. And this rabbi who calls himself Mikey Goldstein, who is a graduate of the Jewish Theological Seminary, um, says that he has got to quit his job because the shul cannot afford to pay him. They get their money mostly from donations. Uh, he volunteered to his board of directors to take unpaid leave. Uh, the government is allowing all people on coronavirus-related unpaid leave to collect unemployment benefits, which will be about 50% of his net salary with no social benefits whatsoever. Uh, he does make money off bar, uh, ben, I'm sorry, bar and bat mitzvahs in the shul. He still prays with them. He gives short services. He teaches occasional classes, but he cannot take on a leadership role because uh, he's no longer working for them. His uh, his husband at the at the same time works for the diplomatic service and is going to Cameroon. So it's not like they're going to see each other at any time, but they still have to foot the bill for two residences one in Israel and one in Cameroon. Well, let's move it along, okay? Well, of course, we here in America are dealing with the election season, and you have right-wing Jews, left-wing Jews, middle-of-the-road Jews, indifferent Jews, but I'm talking here about a Jewish organization. It's called the Democratic Majority for Israel, the DMFI. They are uh, a affiliate, an affiliated political action committee, and they are saying that the Democratic candidate, uh, who apparently is Joe Biden at this point, should agree to support Israel. And that I don't think is a problem from Mr. Biden's point of view, but I'm speaking here about the current administration, which favors annexation of a large part of the West Bank. That's Male Adumim, which is a, a settlement for settlers, people who are determined to hold on to as much or all of the West Bank if possible. Uh, the Netanyahu administration uh, backs this. Mr. Trump backs this. So along come these people who believe that we cannot overstate the long-term damage annexation would have on the U.S.-Israel alliance. The repercussions would be extremely serious and long lasting. Most Americans will only believe, will only support Israel if they believe Israel is committed to pursuing peace. Now, obviously, I'm not a politician, but this Democratic majority for Israel, good stuff, bad stuff. The good stuff is, obviously, they're trying to maintain the um, decades old, years old position, which is that the United States should be an even an equal partner in negotiating between the Israelis and the Palestinians. On the other side, first off, who is the democratic majority for Israel? We, being a very small people, I think the Jews in America amount to less than 2% of the general population. And yes, even though I know we tend to vote out of proportion to our numbers, I'm just wondering why this brand new organization came out of nowhere. We are the most over-organized people in the world. But also, the point is, at this point, nobody really cares about the Palestinians. I do. Other people do. But uh, Hamas is, is not making peaceful noises, and I'll be pointing that out in a later story. But it's just a big mess. It really is. There can be no simple solutions to the Middle East. There has to be some sort of discussion, some sort of planning, and certainly you don't get peace by imposing a plan from the outside. I know it's a controversial area, and uh, I'm again, I apologize if I offended anyone. That was not my purpose. 
So I'll talk about something peaceful and quiet that everybody can agree about. Sending Paul Manafort home, letting him leave prison. He's supposed to be in jail for 7.5 years for tax evasion, fraud, and other crimes. But he'd like to go home early and stay there. Uh, his lawyers say he suffers from high blood pressure, liver disease. He's been a model inmate. He hasn't incurred any infractions or violations while incarcerated. He does not pose any danger to the community. Um, they just want him to come home because he's in prison, and in prison you can catch COVID-19. Well, folks, I leave this up to you. There are people in poorer neighborhoods who are piled one on top of each other, and they are greatly in danger of catching COVID-19. So you decide what should be done with Mr. Paul Manafort. Back to Hamas. Hamas is saying they want ventilators. And if they don't have ventilators, they'll take them by force from Israel. In the meantime, uh, what Israel is saying is that they have offered medical supplies and ventilators uh, to Hamas, to Gaza, because Gaza is under their purview. Uh, let's see. 80 to 90 percent of the ventilators in the West Bank and 87 in the Gaza Strip are currently unavailable. So they're being used by people who've suffered heart attacks, strokes, and other incidents. Well, I'm sure that in some way, shape, or form, Israel will get those ventilators to uh, Gaza. As at the same time, what would you say is happening with the Israeli health minister? He is rabbi, I think he's a rabbi, Yaakov Litzman. He looks like a rabbi. Doesn't he look like a rabbi? Wouldn't you say he looks like a rabbi? Um, and uh, he... Well, his own department put out some orders as far as keeping away from the coronavirus and quarantining and all that business. Um, but uh, generally, okay, this gentleman is, he's a Gerer Chassid. He is 71 years old, and he normally eschews the use of the internet at home. But special arrangements were required after his diagnosis sent him and his entire senior sa staff into self-isolation. All right. Uh, apparently, he didn't. He contracted the virus after attending an illicit prayer gathering of the sort that had been recently banned by his ministry, with one unidentified uh, cabinet member claiming he had put all of our lives in danger. I, I think what this is is an Israeli adaptation of that same business going on in Europe for the Haredim, for the ultras. Um, I, I guess my theory would be, and again, please don't, don't. I'm just evincing a, a, uh, an opinion. If you want to kill yourself, that's one thing, but you have no right to take other people away with you, okay? Because it, it amounts to retzach. It really amounts to murder. Even if you do it unknowingly, it's, it's not, I mean, for God's sakes, we're human beings. People have their own opinions about these things, but this is a matter of life or death, okay? All right, let's see what else, what else? Oh boy, busy, busy. Well, Tel HaShomer, or, uh, these are uh, workers who are wearing the appropriate gear. And uh, well, that's Israel. Let's get back to America. What's happening in America? As you probably know, if you stay up late, and a lot of people have been staying up late and sleeping late the next morning. I can't do that because I teach in the morning. but. Chaim. Um, the late night hosts like Jimmy Fallon and uh, uh, Kimmel, Jimmy Kimmel, are doing their shows from home, which is very sweet and adorable. Because, especially in Fallon's case, because he has two little girls and they absolutely love to climb out of bed and run in and disrupt daddy's show. Uh, Fallon was having a, an interview about life in quarantine. And his daughter, Winnie, Winnie Fallon, came running in to announce, I lost a tooth. And apparently the tooth fairy works even during coronavirus um, sequestrations. Okay, let's see. Bush beer, bush beer. Well, uh, I suppose, I don't do it myself, but I suppose a number of folks are drinking responsibly uh, during this coronavirus thing, and uh, you now have a stronger incentive to do so. 
because the Bush beer folks, are they in Milwaukee? Uh, the Bush beer folks took out a, uh, a, a um, I'm sorry, a tweet that says, people who adopt a dog during this time, because dogs don't know there's a pandemic going on, they're just living their lives, and the beauty of a dog, and of course we love our dog, as you know, excuse me, is that it gives your life a sense of normalcy. Uh, I know someone who worked in a kennel, and she told me that when they uh, offered their dogs for adoption, people came running over because, well, obviously the dogs are always for adoption, but people were saying, I, I have time to train a dog because I'm not doing anything else. All right. Uh, so Bush Beer is giving three months worth of beer to people who adopt or foster during the pandemic. Uh, a relationship with a dog can be during a stressful time. So they're giving everybody three months. That's a lot of beer. <laughs> three months worth of beer if you adopt a dog. Three months supply of beer. Uh, the limit is 500 people. 500 people who adopt or foster a dog from Midwest Animal Rescue in Minnesota. So if you're in Minnesota and you're watching me, thank you. Thank you so much. But you might want to consider going out and adopting a dog. Shelter organizations across the country are attempting to place their animals in temporary or permanent homes as quickly as they can. So if you're nearby the, Mid the Midwest Animal Rescue, you can have a beer and have a dog at the same time. Social distancing is better with a furry friend by your side and a cold beer in your hand. Okay, a $100 prepaid debit card, and here's your puppy. Here's your puppy. Oh, he's a sad puppy. Okay, every sad puppy needs a, needs a dog. That's the amazing thing about dogs, right? Dogs are very accepting. Dogs don't care what you look like, you know, or anything like that, really. Dogs, dogs are very uh, adaptable. Okay. Let's see. Uh, here's, here's a man. He's an infectious disease expert. He absolutely wants to help in the search for a vaccine or a cure to, uh, for corona so that uh, you can kill the pandemic. And um, you'd think, oh, well, hey, give the guy, let him walk. He, he's trying to serve society. Everybody knows that. Let's let's see. The problem is he's accused of stabbing his boyfriend. Uh, his name is Wyndham Latham. He's a former associate professor of microbiology and of immunology. And he argued in a bail motion last week that his experience as a leading bubonic plague expert would help save lives. He's 45. He's been held without bail at the Cook County Jail since August of 2017 when uh, he did the deed that got him in jail. Uh, let's see. With his background and experience, uh, Dr. Latham is well suited to advise and participate. But I'm asking you, do you think a convicted murderer is the kind of person you want floating around in a lab with other scientists looking for a cure to this terrible disease? You, you, you'll let, uh, let them know. All right. Now, this is the time when a lot of celebrities step forward to be nice human beings and do something. Because as I recall, uh, back in the days of the studio system in Hollywood, uh, the actors would say, I don't care uh, what they say I did as long as I, they spell my name right. Okay, fine. But in those days, you had publicity departments whose job was to make sure that the actor was not accused of anything bad. Here's Reese Witherspoon. And like so many of her actor uh, colleagues, she decided to start a dress company. And uh, it's called Draper James. I'm not advertising for it. It doesn't matter because I don't know if they're in business anymore. Um, and she offered a free dress to every single teacher problem is, well, she does employ 30 people, and I'm sure they work very hard. And um, it did sound like Cinderella, but in the end, it was like her brand profited more than the teachers. Because she only had 250 dresses, and she had a whole bunch of teachers. So in the end, what did they do? Oh, she's working on a second giveaway. 
All right. In all of 2019, she sold about 150,000 dresses and uh, she is donating money to an undisclosed charity to help teachers with classroom essentials. Wait a minute. Teachers are not in the classroom. It really would have been nicer for them to get a piece of clothing. Well, never mind. What are you going to do? You do the best you can. All right. Now, this is a story from before Corona. It's actually from the first day of April. And I know you're thinking, oh, well, that's April Fool's. But this is not an April Fool's thing. His name is James Karagianis. And he lives, where does he live? I'll have to find out. Um, and he's an ice cream man, which is all very nice. He uh, drives a, oh, oh, no, they pedal three wheelers, each pulling an ice cream cart east side, west side of, oh, Buffalo, North Buffalo, New York. And they drive through inner city neighborhoods. When I first started, everyone said I should go to the richer neighborhoods, but I needed to be right here. I like bikes. I like joking with the kids and exploring my city. And after almost a de decade in business, he still feels bad when he has to say no to a child who doesn't have a dollar of ice cream, a dollar for ice cream. So he and his staff keep a bunch of freebies to give to children who cannot afford a frozen treat, but nothing is free. So when he sells or gives ice cream to a child, he asks the youngster a math or history question. He'll take out a dollar bill, He'll ask the child who the person is on the dollar bill. And he gives hints. He gives some very strong hints. Uh, the kid knows it's George Washington. and He gives him an ice cream. That's very nice. A word about Karagianis' method spread. Other customers began to kick in donations of $5 and $10. It became difficult for his mobile crew to keep track of the donors. Once again, um, he decided that... They, if they wanted a free ice cream, they'd have to write a thank you note. And those notes were later morphed into postcards designed by a young man who goes to the Buffalo Academy for Visual and Performing Arts. And what else? What else? She got a thank you postcard and a pay it forward campaign to allow people to buy ice cream for deserving children. He put it on his Facebook page. They were at $4,500. And uh, he studied business administration at Northeastern. It's just a lovely little story that um, this, this young man who is building his own business and he wants little boys and girls to have a chance at an education. That's a very, very nice thing. Well, you know, God should look out for him. He's probably not selling ice cream now up there in Buffalo. But as soon as this is over, he'll, he'll be back doing it. All right. Now, KFC, as you know, and I'm not shilling for them. I use that word a lot tonight. I apologize. Um, is is uh, in the business of selling fried chicken. But what they've done is uh, create, well, they didn't do it, but some uh, nail polish company uh, created edible nail polish. Now you have um, nail polish that tastes like fried chicken. There you go. Of course, they're only available in Hong Kong. They come in original and spicy flavors, but just one will be mass produced based on a consumer note, says NPR. Uh, so far, let's see, just when you thought KFC, um, original is actually pretty cute for spring, uh, and if it didn't taste like fried chicken, that's Glamour magazine. Well, I say, okay, I clearly do not polish my fingernails, but if a young woman wants to uh, taste like uh, fried chicken. I think that would be a wonderful treat for her boy or girlfriend. Okay, what have we got? Let's see here. Oh, this is nice. I'm sure you've already discovered this, and I uh, have a gift. Rabbis have a gift for uh, speaking about the obvious. But in this particular case, uh, if you eat dark chocolate, you won't get depressed. If you eat dark chocolate and you're still depressed, eat more dark chocolate. Okay, they've actually done this uh, study, and uh, the University of Calgary and Alberta Health Services Canada, they assess data from thousands of adults, and um, the, so it, you'll, it'll cure your depression according to the type of chocolate consumed. Here we go. If you eat any dark chocolate, it's always the dark chocolate. You know, it's so weird because I grew up on milk chocolate. I really did. Every candy bar, 
And in those days, a candy bar was a nickel. I didn't get that many candy bars, I'll be honest with you. And being orthodox, we didn't uh, trick or treat on Halloween. But um, I, I managed to get enough chocolate. Now, being Pesach, if you recall Barton's, have you ever had a Barton's chocolate? Oh, yes. Barton's chocolate does not melt. Barton's chocolate, I'm sure it's 100% pure chocolate, but it sits in your hands as I refuse to melt because I'm Jewish. When I was a kid, there on Delancey Street, New York City, you had the Barton's store over here. This was Delancey. You had the Barracini store over here. And whatever happened to Barracini chocolate? Uh, I think Barton's just stepped on them. But then Barton's was around for years and years, and very often we would have, um, you know, donation boxes. No, no, we would have drives. We had fundraising drives featuring Barton's chocolate. And it was always power of, and it was always, I'm pretty sure, mostly dark, okay? Now, those were the days when I was going to Yeshiva High School. And uh, Pesach was coming, of course, whether I was aware of this or not, I can't say, because I was a Luftbench, I lived in a fog. But they put a, they circulated a, a paper that said, on such and such a day, it was a Sunday, as a matter of fact, we will be selling Kedem wine, Barton's chocolate. And I went home and showed it to my folks. And they said, oh, this is very reasonable. So they gave me money. And I went to school that Sunday. You have to keep in mind the way it worked in yeshiva in those days. Is that we were off from school on Friday. And when we came to school on, we had to come to school on Sunday, which was a treat, I'll tell you. And we had Hebrew classes. We did not have English classes, secular classes. Because all of our secular teachers taught in the public school system, and they absolutely refused to come teach on Sunday. So we'd have uh, the Jewish classes, Talmud for the most part, and then go home. But before we went home, we were told to go to whatever big classroom there was, and they gave us, they sold us bottles of wine, boxes of chocolate. And there was one year where I was told to bring home two bottles of Kedem wine, it was, I remember, a very tall bottle with a locked-on cap. Could have been champagne. I don't really know. Excuse me. And, of course, those were the days when all Jewish wines tasted like soda pop. You could not get a dry, kosher wine. It was just the way it was. It was yayin mevushal. Excuse me. They would boil the wine. That was part of the preparation process, and it was only Jews involved in its manufacture. Because any wine, and please, I'm not prejudiced, I'm just telling you uh, halacha, the way Jewish law, the way it's practiced, um, any wine that was made or manufactured by Gentiles was called yayin nesech, which is a way of saying a wine that is poured out as a libation offering to idols. Now, come on, we're all monotheists. You know and I know there aren't any idol worshippers. There probably are out there somewhere, but not at least in an organized fashion. Who knows? I don't know. But um, that's why the wine had to be boiled. That's why the wine was heavily sugared. That's why it was all made under a rabbi's uh, supervision, even though then is now. Nobody was stomping the grapes like in that Lucy episode. It was. It's all made by machine. So nobody ever touches it. Not Jews, not Gentiles, not anyone. Well, now we'll talk about the subway pass. Uh, in New York City in those days, if you were a high school student, I don't know if they still do this, you had a little cardboard pass that you put into your wallet in which there was never any money because you were poor, because you were a high school kid. Um, but you would take out the subway pass, you'd show it on the bus, and it cost a nickel. You showed it in the subway, and it cost a nickel. And I come down, there was a very long ramp, I remember, in the 181st Street uh, IND subway station. And I go roaring down the ramp, you know, run, 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 have to run. Even though it was Sunday, there weren't that many trains anyway. What was the rush? And I had my two bottles of wine wrapped up in a vinyl portfolio that I carried. Um, and I show my pass to the man in the token booth and I'm ready to go through the gate and he stops me. I guess he was new. He had never seen a subway pass that was good on Sunday. So I showed it to him, and it was stamped indeed, good on Sunday. And I just went through the gates. To this day, 
I'm wondering, what would have happened if he had asked to see what was in my bag? I mean, he wasn't a customs agent or anything, but he would have found a 13-year-old boy with two bottles of wine. Okay. Well, anyway, getting back to the chocolate, here we go. Uh, dark chocolate may be associated with reduced odds of clinically relevant depressive symptoms. Uh, however, further research is required to clarify the direction of causation. In the case that depression causes people to lose their interest in eating chocolate, there could be other factors that make people both less likely to eat dark chocolate and to be depressed. So what are we going to find? That's all we know. Dark chocolate has a higher concentration of flavonoids, which have been shown to improve inflammatory profiles. Oh, then I could take it for my, uh, for my headaches. Well, okay. When you are an athlete and you make lots of money as an athlete, you obviously go to buy a nice expensive home. Now, Tom Brady, whom, of course, you know, is a famous quarterback, and he has uh, signed with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which I assume is a football team in Tampa Bay. And because uh, he moved down here, he bought himself a nice mansion. God bless him. And he rents it. He's, he hasn't bought it. I'm sorry. He's renting it from none other than Derek Jeter. And the problem is he has no privacy. Now, you got this big honking mansion that faces the water, not the ocean. Um, is it the ocean? I don't really know. Uh, and uh, when you go out to the backyard, there's a lot of boats that have pulled up and people out the front. Uh, the, he's a famous quarterback, da, da, da. He understands that when he goes out in public, he has no expectations of privacy, but he sees his home as a refuge from that. On the bright side, they have 30,000 square feet. Yeah, I'd say that's pretty big. Uh, his kids are there. Uh, his sister-in-law lives with them. They have someone who cooks for them. So everybody's got a little bit of space. Uh, Jeter is living in Miami and because he's part owner of the, my own, uh, the Florida Marlins. Yay. Uh, what else? And okay. So he's done in New England. Maybe I shouldn't have mentioned it because some people from Boston might be listening and they'll be upset because he's not playing for the Pats anymore. Well, what can I say? All right. A lot of people who run, who love to run, who enjoy running, and uh, they participate in races, now they have virtual races. Uh, this, this young woman, her name is Miranda Carfrey, and she is um, a three-time Ironman world champ, and her husband is a triathlete, Tim O'Donnell. They have a one-year-old daughter, Isabel, and she's absolutely adorable. Take a look at Isabel. Wait, where are you? Oop, there you go. See? Okay. All right. Well, she was participating in a stationary, on a stationary bike. Oh, this is her living room in Boulder, Colorado. 39 years old, triathlete, second place in the race. Husband comes in, and uh, he decided to bring in her trophies as motivation. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that loving? Meantime, the yutz, the husband, kicks the uh, outlet and the plug disconnects, so she's done. She did keep going in the race after her bike was reconnected, but she didn't end in the top three. She held up a sign later on that said, it's Tim's fault, and she posted it on Instagram. Well, I wish her the best with her Ironman uh, participations and all that business. Sometimes we go on vacation, and when we go home, we really hope that house and home are in good shape and that everything's okay. Um, so there was a Georgia couple who returned from vacation late last month to find that an intruder had visited nearly every room in the home they'd inhabited for only a week. He, may, he turned on a faucet. He left poopies on the furniture and wood chips across the floor is a rather energetic squirrel. Uh, they're inspecting the mess. They live in the Atlantic suburb of Buckhead. And uh, the, the man who's examining says, he noticed a trail of tiny paw prints leading out of the chimney. He ran across the couch, ran through the living room. It even went in the bathroom, somehow got in the toilet, went in our daughter's room. It chewed on doors, nearly every window frame, and poked holes in the glass. That is a very determined squirrel. He was found behind, uh, hiding behind the couch pillow. 
He was assisted in his exit by animal control, but sadly, they have a $15,000 squirrel damage bill, which is not covered by homeowner's insurance. And they don't know why they bought it in the first place. They're supposed to have a sense of security. And uh, they explicitly stated, this is the insurance company, damage by birds, vermin, rodents, and insects wasn't covered. And all insurance companies we know of have similar exclusions. Uh, they wish it was a, uh, a raccoon, because the raccoon uh, damages would have been covered. I don't think raccoons chew windowsills. It's very sad, really. I mean, what good is homeowner's insurance if, um, you know, it doesn't protect you from things? Well, we talked about Tom Brady and his oceanfront, riverfront, canal front home. And now we have another Floridian. Mike Huckabee. He's a former Arkansas governor. Uh, he owns beachfront property near Pensacola, and the, he and other homeowners have sued for access to their private beaches. That's a very nice thing, a private beach. It was the great Will Rogers, who was a comedian and cowboy, who said that the thing about real estate is they ain't making any more of it. So that's, that's it for Mike Huck Huckabee. Let's see. Uh, they would have had to, okay, it would have exempted the plane. All the beaches have been shut down because of the plague. And it would, but this would give waterfront property owners access as the lawsuit works its way through the courts. Um, let's see, the judge said public health superseded the homeowner's desire because it could lead to coronavirus. And we all have to do self sequestration, self uh, quarantine. Um, whatever it is. Okay, here we have, as you know, there have been astronauts going into space. They've been going to the International Space Station. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I remember many years ago when the uh, space cruisers, when those um, spaceships started going up, ooh, um, they, they said, people were asking, why did you build the space shuttle? There you go, the space shuttle. And the answer came, we built the space shuttle to haul satellite parts into orbit. And uh, the questioner said, well, you know, you built a Mercedes Benz. You could have built a truck. Since that time, we don't have space shuttles anymore, but somehow or other, the astronauts are still getting up there. And for the first time in human history, there is a space crime allegation. Astronaut Anne McLean uh, is accused. She's in, she's in space, mind you. She was improperly accessing the personal bank account of her estranged spouse, Summer Warden, on two occasions while McLean was aboard the International Space Station. Now, that's, that's rough, okay? You're up there in space, and you're... Um, trying to get into your uh, former spouse's, estranged spouse's bank account. That's, nobody caught that? Nobody at NASA caught that? Nobody in the bank caught that? It's, it's, it's bizarre. It boggles the mind. Here we go. Excuse me. The two were in the midst of a uh, separation custody battle, and McLean was not accused of touching the funds. She did admit to viewing the account, she said she was simply keeping an eye on their finances, as she had always done, and Warden never told her to stop doing it. Now, the twist, it's Warden who's been indicted by a federal grand jury. This is the girlfriend whose bank account was examined by the estranged partner, and she faces up to 10 years in prison if convicted. Warden is accused of lying about key details to NASA's Office of the Inspector General, and to the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, the agencies that she brought her identity theft complaint to. There was a grand jury indictment, blah, 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 blah. She gave them incorrect dates, blah, 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 blah. The point is, it's a weird crime, but all the more so because it took place from space. Place from space. Okay. You may recall there was a previous meeting where I mentioned to you, and it, it's a Jewish family after all, of course. He's from Ohio. His name is Mendel Weinstock. He can't but get more Jewish than that. And he has a sister, Reva, and she was getting married. And he said, I'm going to bring a llama to your wedding. 
and she said, if you make me come to, oh, I said, wait, this is the boy, uh, Mendel Weinstock. He said to his sister, if you make me come to a wedding, your wedding, I'm going to bring a llama with me. And she said a llama would surely uh, ruin her special day, but she thought he was joking. So she, uh, she said she was inviting the long-necked camelid. And those were the magic words. Uh, he paid $400 to rent a llama that was used in county fairs. He had a custom tuxedo made for the llama, um, which reminds me of a poem. The one El Llama, he's a priest. The two El Llama, he's a beast. And I will bet a silk pajama there isn't any three L Llama. Okay, I've, you know, I, you always look for an opportunity to give llama poetry on, on a webcast. Uh, let's see. Uh, so he brings the llama, she gives him a look, and you know, sister looks, and I'm a professional little brother myself, can really kill you. It was easier to get in on the joke to, than to fight it. Uh, she doesn't seem to have held a grudge. Uh, he's soon going to uh, graduate from the university, and she says she's going to get back at him. So he should sleep with one eye open. Okay, what's next? Let's see. Oh, asparagus. Time to go to your local uh, grocery and get some asparagus. It's really kind of tragedy. A uh, tragic, excuse me. The veggie generally sold for three dollars a pound in early January, but the price dropped to two dollars early this month uh, because uh, asparagus in the U.S. is cheap because Mexico, a major world supplier of the vegetable, can no longer ship as much to Asia. Instead, the excess asparagus is flooding the United States market and driving down prices. Well, it's good for the consumer, but I'm sure that in the long run, it's not good for Mexico. So if you like your asparagus, and who doesn't? You know, it was years before I could eat that stuff. My mother served canned asparagus. It always seems to be saltier than the usual kind. Um, since that time, I have made my peace with asparagus, but it's still not number one on my list. Expense? Oh, wait, it's not expensive anymore. So when you're uh, in your house with your loved one or ones and uh, you're tired of noshing, what else could you possibly do? Well, you could bake. Here we go. Double Tree by Hilton has revealed the recipe for its famous chocolate chip cookies. Uh, we know this is an anxious time for everyone, says a senior official at the company. A warm chocolate chip cookie can't solve everything, but it can bring a, bring a moment of comfort and happiness. Yes, I cannot tell you how many moments of comfort and happiness I've had in my life uh, attributed to chocolate chip cookies. The truth is, I mean, I, how about you? What's your favorite cookie? Of course, I love those Samoas that the uh, girl that the Girl Scouts buy a sell uh but i i gotta say chips are down so to speak i i do like me a nice uh, oatmeal raisin okay nice chewy oatmeal raisin i'm not eating anything now i'm low on carbs but uh anyway all right it's um in 86 it began as part of their evening turn down service and became a standard offering for all guests and now it's part of the hilton's cookies in space program the astronauts in the International Space Station are baking cookies. They're trying, but the results aren't in yet. They have a video uh, on, on how to make the Double Tree by Hilton chocolate chip cookies. Well, and I know you're sitting there wondering, Rabbi, how do you make soap? Well, I can tell you a few things. I can tell you, for example, that uh, Ben Franklin's father was a soap maker in Boston. And when Ben decided to go into the uh, newspaper business, he moved to Philadelphia. He didn't want to. He was tired of working with his brother, and he didn't want there to be competition and things like that. But as far as making soap, where did it come from? And this is the New York Times. Uh, an accident thousands of years ago. According to one legend, now what you've got, you've got animal sacrifices. This is not something I have personally done, nor do I wish for them to come back. Uh, but animal sacrifices leave ash, and it w it ran into a near uh, it rained on the ashes and the fat. It uh, ran into a nearby river and formed a lather with a remarkable ability to clean skin and clothes. I uh, can tell you, I've read my own favorite soap, which is Irish Spring, because I 
love to take a shower in Ireland. Oh, yes, I do. And it contains uh, something called sodium tallowate, which is from tallow, which is from beef fat. So the, any soap, including the fancy schmancy soap that folks like to buy, or one of my favorites, when you go to those art fairs and you see these big blocks of very colorful soap, same stuff. It's all the same stuff. It doesn't really matter. And uh, it's, got, it's got tallow in it. So people generally think of soap as gentle and soothing, but from the perspective of microorganisms, it's awfully, uh, often extremely destructive. A drop of ordinary soap diluted in water will kill many types of bacteria and viruses, including the coronavirus. That's why they say it's one of the ironies of life. It's a horrible virus. It's, it's killing people. It's laying them low. But if you wash your hands, you can keep it away. And I hope that you can. Uh, I hope you do. Uh, I know they sing happy birthday. I like to sing row, row, row your boat. So um, as far as, there we go. Okay. Thank you. Moving along here. Kroger, Kroger supermarket. When we lived in North Carolina, Kroger was the place to shop. There was another place as well, but we didn't like them so much because Kroger had everything. They were open 24 hours. You could go there at three o'clock in the morning and stand behind a man who had a uh, lawnmower in his cart, uh, also a bag of kitty litter, and uh, ladies' underwear. So you never really knew what kind of life he lived. Uh, I remember also, I'll never forget this because I'm very vain, I hope, um, that uh, the cashier girl said to me, where y'all from? You talk so nice. And I said, New York City, she says, you talk so nice. So ever since then with this horrible <laughs> accent. I've uh, prided myself on how I sound. Well, Kroger decided they're going to give a hero bonus to their employees who are working during COVID-19. Uh, they are the largest supermarket by revenue. I didn't know that. Uh, they're going to raise every employee's base rate of pay by, oh, here it comes, $2, okay, from the end of March through April. Uh, our associates have displayed the true actions of a hero working tirelessly on the front lines to ensure everyone has access to fresh food and uh, so on and so forth. We've got new hires, 30,000 new people who joined in the past two weeks. Um, let's see. Uh, they publish new sanitation guidelines, strengthen benefits during the pandemic, and given all employees a, an appreciation bonus of 300 for full-timers and 150 for part-timers. Do we have Kroger in, in Florida? Somebody can let me know. Okay, here we go. Let's see. This is kind of nice, and uh, even though I got it today and I thought it was current, uh, it is somewhat old. This is a uh, teacher who is an immigrant. She came to this country from Jamaica, and I think that's her in the back. Okay, wait, wait, here I go, here I go. Oh, this is not very good. My goodness, here we are, ah, there we go. Okay, there are the kids. As we pan across, there's the teacher in the back next to the judge. And there are the other kids. All of her students wanted to come and be with her on her big day of becoming a, uh, an American citizen. In 2007, Anne-Marie Small and her son emigrated from Jamaica to Tallahassee, Florida, yay, in hopes of creating a better life. After settling in Florida, she began teaching at Cornerstone Learning Academy. Um, the teachers and students even greeted her at the airport when she first arrived. She was finally able to earn her U.S. citizenship. She felt a bag of emotions. I'm so happy the process is over now because it's been very long. And there were tears of joy because I've had the support of Cornerstone from day one. That's really a very lovely thing. Okay. All right. People are sharing their worst quarantine baking fails. Well, that's why there's no flour in the supermarket because everybody's home baking. I do not bake. I eat, but I do not bake. And uh, they, they, here's, here's a uh, person who created a banana bread. And what does she call it? Uh, what might possibly be the world's most failed, oop, here we go, banana bread. Okay? Um, it's, it's layered. It's very odd looking. I mean, I'm not saying I wouldn't eat it. After all, 
Hey, that's the cool thing with bacon. Even mistakes are, are delicious. But they do get a little bit more bizarre. This is normal bread, okay? The worst normal bread. What what are those things coming out of it? You see that? What what are those very strange antennas? Does it get FM? Very odd. Uh, others lamented the loss of the, Blake, the baking blunder. Uh, I made a Donnie Darko carrot cake by accident, and uh, she tried a bunny-shaped cake, but it turned out a little scary looking. Um, there's the normal bread I just showed you, the most failed normal bread. I guess some people just shouldn't bake. They absolutely should not bake. Okay. And finally, oh, what was one of the chief mistakes? She used baking soda instead of baking powder. Ooh, wow. Okay, and these are the cookies, the bunny cookies. Yum. Okay, see them? They're just a little bizarre looking. All right. Statue of Liberty blueprints are discovered showing last minute changes. Okay, all you folks who work out and you're building your guns, Lady Liberty was supposed to have a more muscular arm. Uh, let's see. It was, but the arm was revised at the last minute. Uh, the French engineer Gustave Eiffel, you know he's named after the tower, uh, helped design the statue. But uh, after he drew his plan, okay, uh, he designed for it to be more robust and vertical, sturdier than it is today. But the blueprints realize that somebody else, we don't know who it was, but it might have been Frédéric Auguste Bartholdi, went in with red ink and revised the arm to be more slender and tilted, making it more aesthetically pleasing, but also more fragile, or as they would say, fragile. Uh, in 2018, they found the blueprints and, um, okay, the, the papers they found were too tightly folded and delicate to open without destroying. So they sent the historic documents to a conservator who put the uh, prints into a humidified chamber to make them more pliable. So they found not only blueprints, but 22 original engineering drawings of Lady Liberty. Now, could you imagine if she had gone out, up the way that Gustav Eiffel in, uh, intended. And Eiffel certainly knew about building metal structures. He built, he designed the Eiffel Tower after all. But now we'll never know because you got that little skinny arm. When I was a kid, you could still go up to the head of the statue and look out through those little peepee -pee windows underneath the halo of, of spikes. But you could not, you were not allowed to go up into the arm. Even then, it was considered too delicate. And we're going back to the 1960s. Okay. Uh, this is my favorite. Well, uh, in, in keeping with our regular tradition of having a very strange animal to finish up our, our session, and thank you so much for being with me and sitting this out. And I, I hope that other folks get to see it when it tapes. This is the Cycrolutes marcidos, the smoothhead blobfish also known simply as blobfish, they live very deep in the ocean and the pressure is 60 to 120 times as great as at sea level. So they are gelatinous. They, they have no structure at all. They can float above the sea floor without expending energy on swimming. And uh, sometimes they get caught in bottom trawling nets, which is unfortunate. It has no muscles. It swallows edible matter that floats in front of it as much as deep uh, ocean crustaceans. And here is the blobfish. Oh, there we go. Is he gorgeous or what? He doesn't look very happy, poor fellow. But hey, it's a life. That's it for tonight. God bless you all. Stay safe. Um, bake cookies. Don't use baking soda. And it was a pleasure to be with you here this evening. Take care. Bye-bye.